Okay, um, so I'm really excited to chat with you guys tonight. I'm thinking of this as a garden party hangout with me um, at my home in my kitchen. Then we're gonna go outside in my garden. Um, I have a lot of stories about plants that I wanna talk about. Um, some of them directly related to garden, some gardening, some of them not so directly related to gardening. Um, so I'm gonna start kind of broad, broad scale plant ecology, and then we'll sort of funnel down into gardening and what you can do in your backyard. So for the first uh, 30 minutes or so, um, I'm gonna give you a really like lightning fast presentation, a whirlwind of my life over the last 10 years basically. And then uh, we're gonna take a brief, brief pause, uh, grab a drink, grab a snack, uh, whatever you need. And then we're gonna go outside and you can ask all kinds of questions. We can talk about whatever you want and I will give you a tour of my you know, modest suburban garden. Um, fair warning, I'm no P. Dudoff. Uh, I do not have a shockingly beautiful backyard. I've only been here a year, um, but I hope to show you a lot of cool plants anyway. Okay, so diving right in. We're gonna talk about biodiversity and why we really care about native plants and conserving them in our gardens. So. This is the first native wildflower basically that, that flowers in our forests, the harbinger of spring. And when everything else is dormant, um, it's blooming and attracting all kinds of insects, uh, flies, bees, pollinators, and in the leaf litter around them are spiders setting up their nests and the twigs and the leaves trying to catch some of these flies. And then there's, you know, nuthatches and chickadees jumping around trying to, I don't know, catch the spiders or the bees, but, uh, the whole corner of the forest comes alive where these little plants are blooming. And to me, that really um, is my, my favorite example of how plants are the foundation of our terrestrial ecosystems. They're the base of the food chain. Um, they are food and habitat for pretty much everything else on land. Um, so we love them. And even if you can't get 100% behind plant conservation, Maybe you love birds, maybe you love fish, maybe you love uh, reptiles and amphibians. And all of these critters, they depend on native plants as well and healthy uh, native plant communities, not just single species necessarily, but whole communities of uh, native plants. Um, so insects rely on native plants and they become bird food for all of our favorite birds. So, uh, I'm just going to kind of chat about the term biodiversity real quick. Some some folks are confused. Maybe it sounds kind of like a technical term, but it's not. It's pretty straightforward. It just really means the number of different living things at uh, a variety of different levels. So you can have biodiversity at the ecosystem level, at the population level, at the species level, which is what we generally kind of think of, I think, when we're talking about biodiversity or also biodiversity at the genetic level, genetic diversity. And um, it's, it's nature, it's these different levels of diversity that are delivering us our ecosystem services, pollination, carbon sequestration, flood mitigation, the things that we kind of rely on in addition to clean air and water and food and shelter. Um, it, it's life that gives us life, right? So um, it's also been shown that diverse communities. So at the community level, diversity is associated with stability. Um, so being able to respond after disturbance and regrow. Um, so resiliency and also productivity increases in diverse plant communities. So biodiversity is important at all these different levels of biological organization. And in fact, it's so important that the United Nations declared this decade to be the International Decade of Biodiversity. Um, and we're, we're at the tailing end. And this, uh, this really call to action from the UN was to uh, have every level of government, every citizen take part in biodiversity conservation, learning about biodiversity, advocating for it, um, and conserving it on the landscape. So in Ontario, we have some conservation goals, um, or we, we have anyway in the, in, in the recent past, that were meant to conserve our biodiversity and 
there are a lot of challenges that get in the way, but um, gardening and focusing on plant conservation can be one approach to dealing with some of those challenges. Yes, harbinger of spring. I'm just checking on the chats every once in a while. Um, I'm gonna turn off my video actually, maybe, if I can figure out how to do that, maybe not. Okay, so biodiversity is great. We want lots of it. We wanna keep it on the landscape. And now my slides are not advancing. There we go. Okay, so one of the challenges, maybe one of the most obvious challenges to conserving biodiversity worldwide is habitat loss. And habitat can be lost because we build them all or, or farm, but habitat can also be lost because it's occupied by invasive species. And most people will recognize this monster as the invasive Phragmites. And it came into Ontario kind of cryptically because uh, there was a native Phragmites australis already present in Ontario, but it did not possess all kinds of these invasive qualities that this um, hybrid uh, Phragmites possesses. So right underneath of our noses, we had this massive invasion and one plant came to dominate all kinds of wetland habitat, um, pushing out native plants, uh, altering the, the physical habitat um, for all kinds of critters. So we're losing habitat in a variety of different ways. Um, um, fragmentation, being one of them. Um, but there's also kind of political or structural kind of civic barriers to native plant conservation as well, um, related to supply and demand forecasting. So it's a, it's a kind of precarious industry. It's a, it's a new burgeoning industry in, in Ontario. And uh, the supply chain isn't always clear. And there's a lot of uh, burden put on private um, native plant nurseries in terms of sourcing seed and growing plants on speculation for projects maybe to happen down the road. Um, so there's also kind of uh, hidden losses when we lose habitat and we lose populations. We're also losing that genetic diversity. Um, so that's a challenge when we're trying to restore plants because we don't necessarily want to draw from populations that are small and fragmented and inbred. We want populations that high, have high genetic diversity when we're choosing our restoration. So um, good quality restoration may not even be possible in some cases. And then of course, there's the just attitude towards native plants. They're messy, they're ugly, they're boring. Um, there's so many you know, gorgeous peonies and daylilies. Why would I choose anything else? Um, so I'm, I'm here to sort of really uh, encourage you and convert you if you're not already kind of converted to native plant gardening, that native plants are really uh, the way to go. So plant conservation and restoration is so important that the United Nations has declared the next decade to be the UN, the International um, Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, highlighting the importance uh, that ecosystems provide to human societies in terms of value, um, economic value, you know, dollar value, um, but also cultural value. And uh, so it encourages uh, everyone to do as much as they can to restore the landscape um, with diverse native plant ecosystems to support other uh, life as well. So now we're going to get in, that's just sort of a really quick wishy-washy overview of, of biodiversity and some of the concerns around conservation generally. But what can we do about it? We can restore plant communities. And I've always thought about this. Ever, ever since I was a little kid, I've always been into gardening and uh, plants and I've wondered, well, how does nature do it? You know, I know how my neighbor gardens and I know how my grandma gardens and but how does nature garden itself how does nature decide which plants coexist together in one spot and and um, which plants are never found together and some of that can be explained by environmental filtering wet versus dry high altitude low altitude that kind of thing and, and sometimes those groupings in nature 
can be a result of interactions between the plants. So competition tends to push similar plants apart and so they don't co-occur. And a process called facilitation tends to bring plants that are similar together so that they can cooperate for a shared resource. So I went to uh, Guelph to complete my master's and I studied how uh, spring ephemeral communities garden themselves, so how they assemble themselves based on their evolutionary history, um, their environmental tolerances, as well as their floral char characteristics. And we found overall that um, communities of spring ephemerals that flowered together were more likely to be of the same color than you would expect by chance. And we, we ran this through some simulations just to understand, you know, how is it that these communities are coming together on the landscape and which combinations of plants naturally um, seem to occur together and why. And so when we talk about restoration, it's really a question of community reassembly, right? So using what we understand about how nature gardens itself, um, can we rebuild a community from its constituent parts, right? Can we reintroduce a bunch of species back onto the landscape and expect to get a plant community or an ecosystem that looks anything like uh, what was once there? So after I completed my master's, I went on to work at the St. Williams Nursery and Ecology Center. I was involved in a number of restoration projects and um, seed collection um, over my years there. One of my favorite plants that I had the great pleasure of working with was the blue lupin, um, which um, has a quite a large seed and it germinates very uh, quickly and grows readily in the sandy soil in Norfolk County. Um, so over the years, I've been able to watch this plant be restored across the landscape. One of the most beautiful native plants that we have. Um, a lot of this work has been done in, uh, with the Nature Conservancy of Canada at their properties around Bacchus, as well as the uh, Long Point Region Conservation Authority. Um, so Lupin is slowly getting back to the landscape, which is amazing, beautiful to see, um, and of course, Everyone knows that lupin is the host plant for the Carner Blue butterfly, which um, has been extirpated from Ontario since the 90s, I, th I think. Sorry, I'm not really a butterfly expert, but it's been extirpated from Ontario for, I think, a couple decades now. And um, it, would be, it would be great to find them back in Norfolk County one day. So, you know, my job wasn't always glamorous and lupins, right? Um, sometimes habitat restoration is really bleak and really ugly and you think how can you ever turn something like a highway underpass into a functioning ecosystem full of native plants but we tried we sure did try and often um, these restorations were done in order to mitigate impacts on species at risk birds often, um, our favorite bobolink and other other birds. Um, and the question is always, well, it, it's really important to restore these habitats for these for these birds, but how do we know that we're doing it right? Um, so I had all kinds of questions. After five or six years in restoration ecology, I decided to go back to school. I had a cool opportunity to um, go back to school and join Dr. Susan Dudley's lab at McMaster University. And I have had a blast for the last four years. We've been doing really cool things um, to study ecosystem restoration and, and native grasslands. We get to light our prairie on fire um, every once in a while. This was done with my colleague Sebastian. I wonder if he's if he's listening in. Um, Dr. Dudley's lab also gets to play with goats. How lucky are we? We get to bring goats out as an invasive species control. And um, you know our, our initial observation is that they really really love a lot of our invasive uh, weeds such as autumn olive, uh, multiflora rose, buckthorn, um, bird's foot trefoil, they will gobble this up. And we brought them out in the late fall and a lot of the native plants had gone dormant or at least had sort of dried up and were, were a little brown and crispy, but all the Eurasian weeds were still 
lush and green and delicious for the goats. So I think, um, you know, goats have potential. Um, you, you hear about it once in a while, goats as, as lawn mowers, but I think goats could be a, a real targeted, targeted solution for um, some noxious weeds. Um, but most of our, most of my work, for my thesis anyway, has uh, revolved around restoring grasslands on roadsides. So we've been working with the Ministry of Transportation to come up with some best practices in terms of seed mixes and methodology to convert um, existing vegetated roadsides into something that looks like this photo on the right, a more diverse native prairie. So not just putting in new seeds where they've created a new road, but how do we rip up and replace an existing road. So I'm gonna go through this really quick, but just um, if, if folks aren't aware, um, Southern Ontario was once home to grasslands and prairies. Um, basically everywhere south of Kingston and the, of the Bruce Peninsula. Um, so it's appropriate to consider grassland in a lot of early successional restorations, whether it's a urban infrastructure corridor like a roadside, or if it's, um, you know, just your own property. So here are some of my, my results really quickly. This is what the site looked like after year one. Uh, that's uh, showy tick trefoil and brown-eyed Susan flowering. I know everyone is going to get a copy of this presentation at the end, so you can kind of sort through it if you want. I've tried to jam-pack a bunch of information into it. Uh, this is a list of native, gra native grassland species that uh, germinate fairly readily and are generally available on the market. I've organized them from roughly dry to roughly in the middle to roughly damp. Um, just if you need some suggestions for some of your grassland creation projects. So by year three, um, this is what our roadsides look like in you know late, late July-ish. Um, and then earlier in June, they were covered in penstemon it's really hard to show the total diversity though uh, that we achieved at all these sites after three years because everything flowers at a different time of the year. Um, so these graphs, I'm not going to get too mathy and technical tonight, but uh, these graphs show just how the composition of our restoration changes from year to year. In the second year, most of our native plants were evening primrose and brown-eyed Susan. In the, in the third year, um, almost all of our um, primrose disappeared and was replaced by a more diverse mixture of our other target native species, which included vervains and penstemons and goldenrods and uh, wild bergamot, things like that. So we had about 15 species altogether. Uh, but this just shows that any restoration is not a static entity. It's going to change over time uh, based on initial conditions, based on your maintenance regime, and just based on natural succession, right? Gla grasslands are early to, you know, mid-successional environments, and they can be invaded by trees and shrubs if they're not kept at bay. So we, we also wanted to know not just how to put plants back on the landscape and does that work, but also if you build a new native plant community, um, how does the pollinator community respond to that? So for all three years, we measured bee diversity and abundance at our restored sites, as well as paired um, unrestored sites, so our, our control sites. And we collected lots of crazy bees. I'm just going to talk about one of them. Um, this is on the bottom here. This is a, I think it's Pepinapis. It is a, uh, a kleptoparasite, which means uh, she lays her eggs in the nests of other bees. So she's a native bee. Um, she herself is a pollinator and will visit flowers, but she doesn't feed her babies. She lays her eggs in the nests of other bees. Um, so you think, well, how are parasites exciting and good? Well, in order to have parasites and to have enough of them to catch in our sample, that means that they have a healthy population of their host bee present as well. So it tells you um, how the food chain, how kind of uh, structurally sound the food chain is if some of these higher level parasitic bees um, can be caught. So that was sort of a good sign. Um, we interpreted that as, as a good sign. But here's, uh, I promise, the last graph of the night. 
um, showing that if you build it, they will come. So we have uh, each uh, one to three years after restoration uh, at our restored sites on the bottom and our controlled sites on the top. And you'll see that in Tilsonburg, our restored sites by year three had much, much higher diversity than the control sites that were not restored. However, uh, at our other site close to St. Mary's on um, a little bit north of Tilsonburg, over the five year, or sorry, over the three years, we didn't detect any difference in the bee abundance, um, even though we had done the same kind of restoration. So this really suggests that, um, you know, local scale restoration can be important to support bee populations if they're able to get there. So the amount of forest cover in Norfolk County or, you know, where Norfolk meets Oxford there is much higher than the amount of forest cover and, and natural cover up near St. Mary's. So our interpretation of this is simply that a lot of the bees can't get there because what we've created is a restoration, but it's a restoration on an island in the middle of soy and corn and, you know, pesticide use and other intensive, you know, land use. Um, so landscape level factors matter just as much as local scale fa factors in terms of restoration. Um, okay, so we even tried putting some lupin on the side of the road in Tilsenburg. So we got a tiny little bit of seed. We put it at one site and we found it flowering last year and we're hoping that it will continue to seed itself. It is a sandy roadside on the border of Norfolk and Oxford County and nearby we found some other prairie associates naturally occurring on the roadside. So thought maybe it is appropriate to to have a loop in here. So I'm going to take a really quick break, check my phone and and shift over to to another topic. Okay, lots to talk about. So it's great that we want to do all these restorations, but where do you get the material from? Where do you, you don't just wander into Walmart and buy a bag of butterfly milkweed seed. Um, not enough to restore several hectares at a time anyway. So this is the process real quick of um, a, a seed strategy, basically. So how to scale up a small amount of wild seed into a enough to do large-scale landscape restoration. And this is all um, based on my work at St. William's and uh, working with really amazing people like Mary Gartshore and Alan Arthur and all kinds of really cool folks from the U.S. that I've chatted with about um, seed conservation strategies. So we know that these, these plants are an asset to us and we love them so much. So we can go out and we can find them and we can collect a small amount of precious seed and because we are gardeners, um, not just me and you, but because human beings are gardeners and we're really good at agriculture, uh, we can scale them up using very standard horticultural, agricultural practices and make sure that every single one of those seeds survives to adulthood and is well watered and kept away from pests so that it has, you know, lives out its maximum potential. And this really helps us grow our capacity to do restoration so that we're not just relying on nature to passively restore itself. So here's a, a fun little infographic of, of the process from wild seed to bulk seed restoration. It's quite simple. Um, it doesn't even require any fancy tools. A lot of it can be done with a shop vac and a screen and a bucket and a little bit of patience. So at the nursery, we, we, you know, we grew a lot of native seed, we grew a lot of milkweed, and because of that, we ended up growing a lot of butterflies, a lot of monarch butterflies. And um, this is cool, everyone loves mo monarch butterflies, everyone has a story about monarch butterflies, um, but it's really about more than just one species, whether it's a bird like a bobolink or a butterfly or even a rare plant, it's more about the interactions that you can weave together and bring together between these organisms like a monarch and a milkweed. But this relationship is mirrored over and over again in our wildlife. There's all kinds of butterflies uh, like this Baltimore checker spot that rely only on native plants. This butterfly needs turtle head, a little swamp plant to, to survive, to lay its eggs on. The giant swallowtail needs uh, prickly ash or hop tree are the only two 
to plants that it will lay its eggs on. So it does need all kinds of other wildflowers to nectar from, but without those two shrubs, we wouldn't have this insect. It's not just butterflies, it's bees too. This is a Monarda bee. It is a specialist on wild bergamot. A tiny, tiny little bee, and you can see that white patch on its stomach there is, is pollen. So Monarda pollen happens to be, you know, very, very bright white. And it collects pollen, stuffs it on its stomach, and that is the only thing it will feed to its developing young. So even though um, Monarda is a very common plant, this little bee is still rare on the landscape. Um, so if you have local extinctions of wild bergamot, you also end up with local extinctions of this tiny little bee. So I would encourage everyone to start with wild bergamot in their garden if you're, if you're just starting out. Um, so what, what I've been talking about mostly is gardening on a kind of landscape scale, restoration on a landscape scale, but a lot of these species will do fine in your garden as well. Um, so this is one that a lot of people are familiar with. You may already have it in your garden, Spiked Blazing Star. It's a great nectaring plant for butterflies. So this brings me to appreciation and the plants, uh, how, how we can appreciate native plants more, either through gardening or um, if we're not lucky enough to have a garden, um, by exploring native plants in their ecosystems, in their native habitats. And I love gardening. I, I, we're talking about gardening tonight, but really I think of the whole world as a garden, or, or at least all of Southern Ontario. We've, we've mucked a lot of stuff up, um, so now it's our job to really actively unmuck it um, in a way that we garden our backyard. So in a way, um, I kind of see the world as one big garden with no fences. All right, back to restoration and appreciating native plants. So this is one of my favorites. I think there was a photo up earlier um, for the foraging talk. This is wild plum. And every year we would collect buckets of these and it, you know, we would make jam from, from the plums and we'd make lots of babies from the seeds. And so this patch of plums was a real opportunity for us, um, an economic opportunity, um, but also just a way for us to connect as human beings to the earth and to these plant communities in a way that's direct by, you know, by making food, by smelling those hot plums on the side of the road. It was a really beautiful place that we loved. Unfortunately, um, somebody else didn't love it so much. This is the same plum grove cut to the ground. Uh, the only trees that were left were non-native trees, unfortunately. So we still have a way to go um, in terms of appreciating the native plants, even, even the weird, ugly shrubs that are on our landscape. And sometimes we all suffer from a little bit of plant blindness. Um, this is my favorite Leopold quote. Basically, um, you know, things don't just happen. Um, there, there's an origin to things that we really need to dive into and a, a lot of the origin is plants in terms of our ecosystem services and why we're here and why we're even able to be here. Um, it all starts with plants and appreciating plants in your garden. Um, so I work on the roadside a lot and there's a lot of little plants that are growing on the roadside, a lot of weird plants growing on the roadside that I can appreciate because I'm a nerd, but not everyone can appreciate because they look like just a green weed like this. However, um, this is a green milkweed. It's not super common by any means and it needs a little help. It needs conservation, but it's not a big fluffy panda. So how do we get people to care about uh, these wispy, weedy little plants. And part of it is gardening. And I, I do promise you, we're going to get to gardening by 8.30. Don't, don't you worry. Um, but also, you know, seeing these plants in, the, in their natural habitat and having the opportunity to be able to grow these plants from seed and to really understand the precarious, uh, you know, life cycle that some of these plants have. And I think that's a way to really learn to appreciate them. So um, I could go on and on and on about all my favorite weedy little plants. This plant is a, uh, a hemiparasite, so it uh, derives some of its nutrients from other plants, other native plants, uh, the wood betony. 
Um, it has a relative, another hemiparasite that is fairly common up in the Bruce Peninsula, uh, the scarlet paintbrush. And, and these plants are, are easier to appreciate, right? Because they're more colorful, they're more attractive. We think, oh, I want that in my backyard. But it's not always easy to grow because you need the host plant for this hemiparasite to form with in order to have a population of it in your backyard. So it's not as straightforward as, like I said, you know, strolling down the road to the local hardware store and buying some scarlet paintbrush off the shelf. Um, so if you, if you, I mean, if you want to appreciate plants in their natural habitat and you live in Norfolk, you're lucky. It's a very special place to, to botanize. Um, but another place that's dear to my heart is the Bruce Peninsula. There's all kinds of really cool plants up there. Um, carnivorous plants like this sundew, other carnivorous plants like this, um, what is it called, butterwort, pinguicula. So this plant will catch insects on its leaves and digest them on its leaves. It's home to a number of um, endemic species that are found only in that part of the Great Lakes, as well as a variety of different orchids. And I've had the great pleasure of visiting these orchids over the years um, and learning about them. Um, I visited the Calypso orchid on Flower Pot Island, and to me, that was nature's garden right there, right? I lined up with tourists from around the world to have my five minutes to sit with the Calypso, and it was the closest thing I've come to a religious experience outside of gardening, right? Um, when you're down on your hands and your knees, staring at these little plants face to face, it really is a bit transcendent. And that's the power of gardening. So if you're not a gardener, um, that is one of the benefits of gardening is that it's, um, it can be, you know, really, really fulfilling um, in a deep sense. And one of the most fulfilling moments I've had with an orchid is when I was picking strawberries at a restoration site um, in, I think it's Clear Creek, uh, outside of Norfolk. And uh, my, my colleague showed me this tiny little rare orchid, this tiny little brown orchid that had made its way into a restoration site some 15, 20, maybe even more years after. It, and it definitely was not seated there as part of the restoration. It found its way there because the restoration was um, so mature and um, so well developed that it considered it to be suitable habitat. So this was a really wonderful example for me, inspiring to keep going, you know, restoration works. All right. I'm probably going to have to skip over a whole bunch of stuff if we want to go outside, but that's okay. So we all want to do restoration. We all want to garden with native plants. There's a huge demand right now for native plants. And uh, part of the work that I'm doing with the Ontario Plant Restoration Alliance is gauging that demand across the across southern Ontario. So if you have any native plant projects coming up, any gardening projects that you're planning for, please let us know about them. Um, fill out our survey so that we can better understand the native plant market in Ontario. So um, I'm going to skip over quite a bit of stuff here and focus on some of the plants that I like to use in my garden and some uh, gardens at friends and families. Um, that you may not be familiar with. You know, I'm not going to talk too much about Brown Eyed Susans. Um, so this is my all-time favorite, and it just started flowering tonight in the garden. This is a slender vervain, um, related to blue vervain or hoary vervain, but much, 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 much smaller, um, less than a foot tall, and it thrives in really dry, arid soils. So it's an ideal plant for a small urban space, for a pot, for the edge of your perennial garden if it's uh, hot and sunny and dry. Kind of like a mini little lavender. My, my next absolute favorite native plant is the biennial bee blossom or the, the gara, gara biennis. This is related to evening primrose. It can be uh, a medium sized to very large plant, depending on how much water and sun it gets. And it will be covered in these gorgeous little pink and white blossoms um, in late summer that the bees absolutely love. 
The bees also love this one is giant hyssop. It is a very tall plant. The flowers are not too showy for our eyes, but the insects absolutely love this plant. There are bees on it 24 seven. And it has a really interesting kind of architectural shape that we will see later out in my garden. I also love goldenrods, and we're gonna talk a lot about goldenrods later when we tour around my garden. Goldenrods are super, super, super important uh, nectar sources for migrating butterflies and for, um, you know, late season pollinators. And they are virtually all native. As far as I know, there are, you know, 20 odd goldenrods or, or, or so in Ontario and they're all native. Um, and none of them cause allergies. So if you have a goldenrod allergy, I am here to magically uh, cure you. Um, you can't really have an allergy to a plant that is insect pollinated because the pollen is heavy and sticky and needs to stick to the body of the insect in order to be carried away and, and to pollinate another plant. So most people are suffering from ragweed allergies at the time that goldenrod is flowering, but because ragweed doesn't have a showy flower, they blame the goldenrod. So people don't want to plant goldenrod because of that reason. The other reason they don't want to plant it sometimes is because they think it's a bully, it's a thug in the garden, and some species definitely are. So Canada goldenrod, uh, tall goldenrod. Um, I would not plant these in a home garden unless you have a naturalized you know, acre or something like that. Um, but there are a lot of smaller goldenrods that are suitable for garden conditions. And my absolute favorite is the, the bicolored goldenrod or the silver rod a small little dry woodland goldenrod. There are also white flowered goldenrods, believe it or not. Um, this is a goldenrod, a, a tiny little mounding goldenrod, almost looks like a small chrysanthemum, um, but it is in fact a goldenrod. Asters are also really important for late season pollinators, and there's a variety of different blue asters. Um, I think the azure aster is probably my favorite and probably the latest blooming of all of them. So you'll have flowers on this plant um, into October and uh, just a, a gorgeous color against yellow fall foliage, things like that. Um, wood phlox. I love this plant. Just started growing it from seed a couple of years ago. It's uh, sort of slow, but um, amazing color. Here are some photos in the wild. So some of the plants that I've been uh, trying to grow from seed are fairly uncommon in the wild, but they're not protected provincially or federally. Um, and so there's not really a lot of attention paid to them in terms of restoring them on the landscape. So the following are just a few species that I've been trying to grow with mild success. Um, pale coneflower is our native alternative to the purple coneflower, which many of you may have. Um, there are a variety of native legumes in Ontario, and legumes are members of the bean family. They're very important in the garden because they fix nitrogen in the soil. So I have assembled uh, a number of my favorite legumes. Some of them are uncommon but not often used, like uh, this milk vetch and bush clover. Um, and some of them are, are more rare, like the lupin or this creeping tick trefoil, or even our species at risk. Virginia goat's rue. So this plant is found only in Norfolk County in, in Canada and is at risk from habitat loss um, and, and other things like invasive species. So I've not had the pleasure of growing this plant. It is very highly protected and there's a lot of people working on recovering this plant, but it is a, an important native legume in the Norfolk County landscape. So there are a number of other species at risk that I've had the pleasure of working with, either um, monitoring or collecting seed for. Um, and one that I've always wanted to work with is the white wood aster. And uh, we will be putting in an application to do some seed conservation work with this plant a little bit later. Okay, gardening. How do we choose our plants for our garden? Well, we go for a hike in the woods, and I've had the pleasure of visiting some really amazing places. One of the most, you know, knockout diverse places that I've been 
uh, close to an urban area is the 16 Mile Creek. And we can use these sites close to our project sites as reference guides to our gardens. And we can find habitats and growing conditions out in the wild and look at the plants that are growing there and uh, choose those plants for similar conditions in our own garden. Um, so these are plants uh, that thrive in clay soils. Uh, the 16 Mile Creek Valley is mostly clay soil. Uh, with a very steep bluff, um, which is kind of rocky and gravelly with a little bit of sandy topsoil at the very edges of that bluff. And all along the bluff, you have ground nesting bees, which depend on the spring ephemerals that are also growing along this bluff. So um, we like to use a, a lot of uh, early saxifrage, the spring ephemeral in clay sites, dry clay sites um, in urban areas. Uh, moving along through the season, um, there are surface berries perched on those dry bluffs. And so this suggests that a surface berry is a really great idea for these tough, um, compacted urban soils as well. One of my favorites that we're going to see in a couple minutes is the yellow pimpernel, a uh, relative of dill. And this is a host plant for swallowtail butterflies. There are also native vines like this uh, honeysuckle vine, some native shrubs like this buffalo berry, as well as sunflowers like this woodland sunflower. And all of these plants are growing in pretty hard, dry, compact clay, and some of them are growing almost vertically, like this ancient cedar tree and sassafras trees growing on the side of a bluff. Pretty amazing. So we're going to talk about gardens. I um, have a couple gardens. I would have really loved to tour you around the garden at my parents' house in Norfolk County, which I've been gardening since I was a teenager and is quite beautiful and is a bit more of a showpiece. My home garden, I've only been here for a year, so it's a work in progress. I'm going to show you some of the projects that I have on the go, some of the species that I've planted this year, some of the seedlings that I have, we're going to talk about garden design. Hopefully people have questions about which plants do I plant together. Um, so I've put together all these resources, not necessarily to talk about right now, but so that you have these guides later on if you're trying to plan for your project. So um, these are just some combinations that I have in my own garden, in a wet spot, in a dry sunny spot, and in an area with some decent soil. So I think actually I'm going to probably pause there because we're going to transition outside. Uh, these are some of the plants that I put in last year in my rain garden and this is about a month ago. So we're going to check on those plants in the rain garden, see how they're doing, see how big they've gotten. Um, and then before I, we pause for a drink break, I just want to um, bring everyone's attention to this really, really cool program called the In the Zone Gardens Tracker. So it's a, a web-based program that you can register your home garden, including how many native plants you have, how, how big your garden is, all kinds of um, ways that you um, use green methods to garden, um, how connected you are with your community through your garden. And what's really cool about uh, registering within the zone is that it tracks the amount of habitat that home gardeners are creating across the Carolinian zone which shows the, you know, the power of collective impact, right? Um, so if you have time, definitely register. It's really simple. Um, it's just a form that you fill out, answer some questions about your garden, share some stories about your garden. Um, when you register for, for In The Zone, you um, qualify potentially to win a pawpaw tree later on in the year. Um, it also is a great resource to link you to local native plant growers and to link you with experts, um, consultants, anybody that could give you advice on planning your garden. So I'm going to pause there. I need a drink. I've been talking at you a lot about native plants. We're going to reconvene in like two or three minutes outside and then we can answer as many questions as we have time for and I'll show you some plants. Okay. Um, I'm going to pause and switch switch outside. See you in two minutes. If 
I can figure out how to use this thing. Okay. <laughs> okay, so Joelle popping in here again. While we are waiting uh, for Stefan to get set up outside, now is a great time to start answering some of, uh, sorry, asking some of those questions. Um, so we can be ready to, um, for him to answer them once he gets there. So um, there's lots of really great questions that have already pulled out from the chat as we've been going on. If you have any other questions about your garden, uh, now's the time. Ask them in the chat room. We're really excited um, for that to happen. Just going to pop back on here for a second while we're waiting for Stefan to get set up. Um, if you're just joining us, I know a couple people have. Um, just make sure uh, we're waiting for Stefan to transition outside so he can give us a little awesome tour of his garden. Um, now is the time to ask lots of questions. Ask them in that chat so we can make sure to, um, to answer them. There's a lot of, um, he, he, wow, listed off a lot of really, really great plants there for us got some great ideas for my own garden. So I'm looking forward to uh, seeing him outside as well. Awesome, and there he is right behind his lovely sign. Cool, okay, great. Stefan, I'm gonna pass it back on over to you. Um, there's lots of great questions coming in. Uh, you are still muted, don't forget uh, if you're, yep. Sorry about that. That's okay, no worries. Um, yeah, so would you like me to just start reading off? There's a lot of great questions coming in. You want me to start reading some off for you? Yeah, apologies for any background noise. I live in a busy neighborhood, uh, but yeah, please go ahead. Sure, um, I'm gonna pop off the video just so you can do that. Um, oh, so many awesome questions here, okay. Um, Someone wanted to know, uh, where do you suggest getting the seeds for native plants and finding them to begin with? Sure, uh, it, it depends on the quantity of seed that you need. Um, so if you're looking for a large quantity, there are a few suppliers in Ontario, but only a few. Um, Ontario Native Scapes, which is uh, close-ish to, to Sarnia, there is, of course, the St. Williams Nursery and Ecology Center. Um, I believe that Sassafras Farms in the Niagara region was also supplying bulk native seed, um, last year anyway, and uh, wildflower farm as well, particularly if you're looking for a smaller quantity or individual packets of, of seed and they have a sort of interactive website that shows you the origin of where um, those species come from. I would start there. Um, and then there's sometimes municipal programs or some NGOs like Carolinian Canada or uh, WWF that have um, seed packets that they give away with different programs. So maybe just check out some websites. Um, um, yeah, I know the city of London was giving out milkweed for a while. So check out those places. Awesome. Okay, here's uh, another couple questions. Um, how do you prepare a site for native plants I, when it has either invasives like creeping bellflower or goutweed, or if there's a large patch of an undesirable plant like poison ivy. Right, um, so site preparation can be the most expensive and time consuming part of a restoration in the cases of things like goutweed. Um, so um, you can use herbicide, um, there are options for that in terms of like Roundup. Um, 
but a, a sh well, a shallow tilling on goutweed probably would just encourage the goutweed even even further. So for something like that, I would start by um, smothering it with blankets, tarps, shading it out. That'll make it easier to pull, but it's probably going to have to be something that you um, deal with repeatedly. Um, if it's a if it's a large site, um, probably uh, herbicide is your really your only option, especially if it's a super noxious weed. Um, in some cases, you can actually strip the soil off. So, in in two of our roadside sites, because we had such an issue with weeds, we stripped off about five inches of topsoil, and that removed much of the weed bank anyway and those weeds um, because we didn't feel like we would actually be able to kill the plants with herbicide enough to open up the soil to let the plants in. It's also going to be um, you know just an ongoing battle. I, my, I like to say it's like undressing a salad or untoasting toast. Some of the changes that have happened to these plant communities are virtually irreversible. Um, so you may always have a legacy of goutweed despite your best efforts, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Um, if it's a smaller area, goutweed typically is more of a garden pest. Um, I would smother it with tarps. I hope that's I hope that's helpful. I know <laughs> I there's not so. a, there's not a lot of hope with invasive plants sometimes. It, it can be difficult, definitely. It's a never-ending battle sometimes. It seems like. <laughs> um, here's another great question: Have you noticed that the demand for native plants can need to, can lead to plant poaching, so, uh, i.e., digging up plants from the wild? Does that harm wild populations of native plants? Absolutely, of course, and I actually apologize for not talking about ethical plant growing, native plant growing. So um, the demand does make people kind of want things immediately. I don't know, it's our consumerist culture, I guess. Um, but when you're choosing your plants from a garden center, from a supplier, ask about how they were grown. They should have been grown from seed, um, in a, and that seed should have been collected in a sustainable way from a known population. Ideally, our plants being grown for garden use are coming from what we call ex, ex situ or, or kind of captive populations. Um, so the growers aren't continually putting pressure on wild populations, but that still doesn't stop people from digging up a trillium because they want a trillium and none of the garden centers have one. Um, so in, in no way, when I advocate for native plants, am I advocating that people dig them up one area I find this kind of troubling, particularly is with native orchids, because orchids are very tricky to grow from seed. And when I hear of, of native orchids, other than maybe the yellow lady slipper available on the market, I always reach out to the grower and ask where they're coming from. And, and sometimes I'm concerned to hear, I'm concerned when I hear they're coming from the wild, but from private property, so it's okay. That's not okay either. You know, digging up even a trillium from private property and moving it is not okay. Um, you're, you're disturbing the whole soil community around that patch. It's not just the individual, you know, stock that you're pulling out. You're, you're really disrupting that whole patch. Um, so yeah, ask where your native plants are coming from. They should be seed sourced and they should be locally and ethically seed sourced. Great question, uh, great response there, definitely. Um, here's another question. Do you have one or two books that you would re recommend to beginners who want to work to naturalize their garden? Sure, um, so uh, Lorraine Johnson has two books that I've uh, used. Um, I think one is 100 Easy to Grow Native Plants. Sorry, somebody's doing some construction, if you can hear it. Um, so I would start there in terms of the easiest plants to grow. There's also lists available through um, In the Zone Gardening, so virtual, virtual resources um, that uh, will help you choose some easy plants to grow. Um, some of my slides have 
um, plants that I like to work with because they're easy to grow and it will show you their height and their kind of growing conditions in terms of light and moisture. So there are a variety of different guides out there. Um, also, you, you can't go wrong with, you know, some, some good field guides um, because when you're getting inspiration for your garden from your local natural areas, it's good to just go out and see what you can identify um, that suits your garden. So uh, I would encourage you to kind of, you know, learn about uh, the plants in your local local community and a field guide or something like iNaturalist can, can really help with that as well. That is great. Okay, um, so lots of great questions. Um, let's see here. Uh, Here's one. In designing a local plant garden, is it necessary to rid the space of other non-Indigenous plants? Is it possible for them to coexist? I believe yes. I, I'm, I'm not a, a purist in my own garden. Um, I bought this house and there were hostas and there are still hostas. But I ripped out the periwinkle. I cut down the buckthorn. Um, so the way it was once phrased to me uh, by a, uh, a, a colleague is that, you know, just like people, not all non-Indigenous people are violent and oppressive and invasive. And she described plant interactions in the same way. And um, from her perspective as an Indigenous person, she feels that a lot of non-native plants are still fine um, because they are benign and some of them in fact have become part of her, her culture and her heritage. Um, so it's really about the individual identity of the plant. You know, is it replacing, is it super aggressive and is it replacing all kinds of native diversity like a Phragmites or a dog strangling vine? Or is it just a hosta? Is it just sitting there? Um, so definitely there are some non-native plants that can coexist, um, but I think ultimately the goal should be uh, restoring as much of the landscape to a native ecosystem as possible because especially in southern Ontario we've lost you know 90 percent of the of the natural area. So yeah I would say Tolerate a few, but um, keep keep that goal for for more native plants. Awesome. Okay, um, there are a few people. It looks like they're trying to convert their front yards to meadows or prairie gardens. Um, do you have some recommendations for plants or or companion planting that that might be really good for that? You're still muted. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen for just a second because I have some slides that'll help us talk through and then um, we can actually look at some of the things that I did for my yard. Okay, so in terms of combinations, uh, these are combos that I came up with based on uh, the soil conditions, the growing conditions that you have. So if you have a, if you want a tall grass prairie wildflower garden, this is the combo for you. And I have um, outlined some species here, but really this is my guide. Th this is my sort of video game of native plants. So you start with the easiest, lowest growing, kind of tamest ones, and you grow from there. So I have upland and lowland, um, different combinations showing different heights. So you don't want to plant a prairie smoke next to a big blue stem and then have the big blue stem flop over onto your prairie smoke. So I like to choose plants of similar heights so that they all keep each other propped up um, as they're growing in a meadow. And because you're not probably designing it in a formal way with mulch and stones and things, um, you've got to kind of keep it semi-organized looking. So I find grouping plants of similar heights together helps everything kind of stay up, upright. Um, uh, 
but yeah, this, um, this shows some of my favorite native plants. A lot of them are, you know, easy to find on, on the market, um, shows their height and then the amount of moisture they need and the amount of sun they need just in those little icons. So hopefully um, things like this and um, in the zone can also help you pick the actual plants um, that you wanna use. I have a sort of tall, taller grass, prairie-ish thing in my backyard. And then the front and in the side over here, I have a more uh, Elvar or short grass kind of meadow inspired combination. So I can, I can walk around and show you those two maybe in a minute. Um, but if there's other questions while I'm sort of sitting here. Sure, uh, here's an interesting one. Um, do you ever use some of those hemiparasitic plants that you mentioned earlier when establishing a wildflower meadow, particularly over an area that was previously turf grass? You're muted again before you... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay, I'm, I've now turned on, I think, my, my mobile device. I'm going to, um, I think, tour around the garden a little bit and show you some of these things while we're talking about them. Okay, can you, can you see me? Yes, we can. So if you want to stop the video on your computer, yes, now we can do that. Um, yeah, and then why don't you give us a brief tour of the garden and if we have any time for any more questions left, that would be awesome. And you are muted if you're talking, um, Stefan, so just so you know. We're having trouble hearing you. It says that you're not muted. Um, can you make sure that your video is still going? Uh, or sorry, your audio, oh, yeah. and your microphone? Oh, now I can hear myself. <laughs> How was that? Oh, there we go. I can hear you now. You can hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. So sorry, guys. So this is, here I am at my little desk outside. We've got 15 minutes. I'm gonna give you a tour of the garden. Um, jump in at any time with questions. But the last person asked about hemiparasitic plants and I actually uh, have some of them growing. So this is my little meadow. And these are some of my little seedlings here. And these are some of my hemiparasite seedlings. And here are some of the better ones. Okay. So this is wood betony, the Pedicularis canadensis. And I've got it growing with a host, sedge. This is Carex sprangeli. So um, I have found that the wood betony does need a host or it needs to be fertilized. Otherwise, the seedlings don't grow them more than one leaf. So the ones that I grew without um, this sedge didn't grow very fast at all. And a lot of them died and are just hanging on with one leaf. These are the best ones that I had and they are growing with this is a Sprengel sedge, a native sort of dry woodland sedge um, that they share a habitat with. Um, so I, I use this, but my understanding is that wood betony will um, parasitize most native grasses and sedges. That is my understanding. Um, so 
I'm not sure if they will work with sod grass. That's not something I've ever tried. But if you're seeding a new restoration site, you could seed down some native grasses like Virginia rye or switchgrass or something like that, or even some sedges. Um, and if you can find seed for wood betony, that might help uh, establish the betony. Awesome. Um, and so people, if you have any other questions, feel free to ask them as we come in. We have a couple of those. Why don't you just, uh, yeah, I guess keep touring us sure. around your garden and then we'll see what other questions come in. Great. So this is the plant I was telling you about, the tall yellow hyssop. It will branch out and look like a candelabra about you know five or six feet tall. I've got some beans growing up around it. This is my I call it my mini Elvar inspired garden uh, next to the path. This is probably the driest, hardest soil in my backyard. So I put a bunch of rock loving plants on top of it. That's hairy beard tongue flowering. Uh, we've got some nodding onion in the background that'll come on later. And of course the poofs are prairie smoke. So all of these plants are found on rock meadows or alvars so i thought my stone path kind of resembled an alvar um, but now i want to take you to my rain garden so this is the part of my garden near the shed and the fence um, that floods every time it rains i'm on heavy clay here in st catharines so some of my rain garden plants somebody just asked about a gentian so i do have bottle gentian in my rain garden and it loves wet feet. I also have turtle head growing. So that is the host plant for the Baltimore checker spot. I've also got these beautiful river avens that have formed really nice clumps. And this is the seed that they produce. So they made tons of flowers this spring. The bees love them. And so I'm gonna have a lot of seed later on. Um, so yeah, this is my rain garden. I'm just kind of zooming out here. Oops, got my finger over it. And the highlight of my rain garden right now is my daughter here, my daughter, the Triffid. Uh, this is Angelica, the purple Angelica. Kind of looks like a hogweed, but it's totally smooth and very purple and will not give you a rash if you touch it. Um, it's my favorite plant right now. It grows very big. It grew that big just over the last month and a half. But other fun plants I have in my rain garden, got uh, swamp milkweed, of course, just starting to bud out. So you definitely need swamp milkweed in a rain garden. And it doesn't need to be wet all the time. It will tolerate some occasional drying out in the summer months. Uh, next to it, I have a really happy, dense blazing star, which I've had for several years. So the, the story here is we, we moved about a year ago and this garden was empty and I plunked everything into the grass as it was because I wasn't sure how long we were gonna stay and I didn't really wanna fuss with in, importing soil and mulch and all that nonsense. So I'm like, okay, I have to find native plants that will grow in this seasonally mucky flooded soil. So I did and they're doing pretty well. Uh, the next one here we have is a goldenrod. I told you I love goldenrods. This is a fairly rare prairie goldenrod called Riddell's goldenrod beautiful grassy leaves and it will shoot up flower stem later in the summer. It's a very tame goldenrod. It doesn't spread all over the place. It stays in a nice clump. Um, more goldenrod next to it. This is a viscid goldenrod. And then moving back here, we've got more of my favorite tall yellow hyssop, which I hope eclipses the fence by the end of the summer growing with some tall meadow rue um, and then we've got some blue vervain and wild bergamot against the fence growing with my favorite carolinian grass this is waygan's wild rye um, so if you know canada rye 
It looks similar, but it gets quite a bit taller and the seat head is even squirrelier. Uh, so it's doing well along the fence. The, the driest one is not so happy, but the wetter ones are a little bit happier. Um, so why don't I show you some of the things that I have in pots? Uh, this is sure. my little green. Yeah, this is my uh, little green. Are there other questions that I? Uh, just a quick one while you're kind of going through that. Uh, have you ever had any trouble with your neighbors over this more kind of natural uh, look to your garden? Uh, the front of our garden does not look like this. The front of our garden is is just sort of mowed lawn, and in fact, most of my lawn is plain mowed lawn. Um, so I've had no problems here. Uh, at back home, our, our neighbor thought they were doing us a favor in weed whacking a back corner of our garden full of rare savanna plants. Um, so that was an issue, but mostly it's been fine. People don't complain um, or anything like that. Not in my experience. The, the last place I was at, we ripped up the whole front yard and replaced it with a native plant meadow, low growing, but we kept a buffer around it, the width of a lawnmower. So it kind of framed in the wildflower meadow a little bit and kept that buffer between the sidewalk and the path and all of the plants. So I think there are ways um, to kind of make it both messy and formal at the same time. So I, I like to keep a little patch of my grass unmowed for the critters and for the hybrid clover, um, but I do mow under the trees. We like to sit out here and have picnics and stretch and stuff, so we use the lawn a lot. Um, I'm growing a lot of seedlings. These are for different uh, projects in North Dakota County and in Niagara region. Um, some of the cool plants that I've got here, this is a stout goldenrod and these plants are five years old and they are finally flowering. Um, so I'm very excited to get more seed and to be able to propagate more of them. And then here are my native plants in pots. So the bright orange is a nasturtium, obviously. I love nasturtiums and they kind of make the containers a little more familiar feeling. But everything else in them is native plants. So I had columbine that flowered early in the spring and some sedges. The nodding onion will come on later in the summer. Um, this really pretty little white one flowering right now is long-leaved bluets, which is another um, Elvar savanna type plant and really loves growing in a pot. Um, so the other plants I have in here include Sweet Everlasting, some Sprengles Sedge, I have a service berry and one of them stuffed in there, um, as well as some of that stout goldenrod. So all of these pots I keep outside all year round. Um, I put them in the shed in the winter and I don't water them past about December 1st and then start watering again around March 1st when I bring them out. So that's a nice pot of columbine there. Cool. Um, for the rest of your garden, do you have, or for all of it, do you have a watering system? Do you use a hose? How often do you generally have to, to water some of these native plants? So when they're first established, they do need a bit of watering, especially in my hard compact clay. Um, but after they're established the first year, they don't need any watering. I have a couple of aquariums. I keep fish as a hobby. So every time I do a water change, I use that water out in the garden. Um, but other than a heat wave in July, I don't do a whole lot of watering on established plants at all. Good to know. Um, another question. Uh, is it ethical to harvest our own seeds from wild populations? So it's important to do your research and figure out how common your plant is. And also it's important to get permission from the landowner. 
there are some spaces where it's totally ethical to collect common species such as roadsides or municipal parks or if you have a woodlot in your, in your backyard. Um, collecting seeds from common species really doesn't do much harm. Those seeds need to disperse anyway and a lot of them will come off the plant without you having to disturb the plant at all. Um, but I definitely don't, don't recommend collecting seed of rare species or seed off of property that you don't have permission to be there, uh, which includes conservation areas, nature reserves, things like that. So um, a lot of those places are open to restoration though, and may give you a permit to collect some seeds. Um, but if you're just looking to collect something like a milkweed, for example, you can, if you do it in a safe way, collect that kind of seed off of a public roadside um, or, or kind of a ditch, anywhere you can find it, as long as you're doing it safe and you're not trespassing. Well, um, another question, do you cold stratify anything? Aha, good question. So we're gonna go over to the little seed station here. So a lot of native wildflowers need to be stratified. A lot of them don't, but they all pretty much benefit from it. So the easiest thing to do is to get a little baggy, get a little bit of mo moistened peat moss, and then you put your seeds into that baggy, into the fridge for about a month. Some will need longer than that. And I would probably recommend the Prairie Moon website as the best resource for most wildflower seed germination information. So they'll tell you how long it needs to be in cold moist stratification. Um, but some things don't need it. So brown eyed Susan, wild bergamot, they don't necessarily need it to break their dormancy, but they will benefit from a week or two in cool, damp conditions before they germinate. So it is kind of species by species. Um, uh, but yeah, check out Prairie Moon. They have a really cool database for stratification information. Awesome. And then I guess just uh, probably one last question. Um, do you uh, see if somebody's looking to go into restoration ecology or plant restoration as a career, is that um, an option for a career path? Is that a good option? Would you recommend school? What, how, how, how would you recommend somebody get into that? Sure. You know, I, I've, I've always found it uh, easy enough to get a job um, with some plant knowledge. People really have a lot of questions about plants and are unsure about plants. And so if you can be a plants person, I don't think you'll ever not have a job. Um, in terms of restoration, I think the most important thing you can do is to join a naturalist club or to otherwise familiarize yourself with the biogeography of the region that you want to work in. Um, this includes uh, being able to identify the plants and some of the major kind of geological features that are shaping the plant communities and the ecosystems that we're trying to restore, just as a foundation. Um, but other than that, other than that um, you know, you can always volunteer with different organizations to do invasive species removal and, and to learn that way. It's a, it's a really good way to get involved. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much. We're already getting calls for there to be a part two of the webinar. We might have to do that. It seems like people are loving this if you're up for it. Um, Kristen's going to pop back on here in just a second. Um, yeah. Do you have anything, any kind of final words that you'd, you'd like to, to say, Stefan? I kind of wish I had more time with you. So <laughs> I hope there is a part two um, and we can talk more about plants. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you so, so much. Your knowledge was awesome. I learned a lot. This was, this was really great. And yeah, hopefully we can do that again. And I guess here's Kristen. Thank you again, Stefan. 
Yes, thank you, Stefan. I learned a lot. I've been jotting notes the whole time, as I'm sure everyone else has been. And, and this is just, you know, a reminder that, that we will send out a recording of this webinar, as well as um, some of the, the references that he mentioned with the books and then the websites. And there's been stuff coming up in the chat, great references as well. So we'll make sure to include as many of those as we can. Um, one last time, thank you to all our sponsors who made this possible for us tonight and potentially a part two to be determined. Uh, thank you, Stefan, again, for taking the time to chat with us about this fantastic topic. And uh, thank you for everyone to joining us tonight. And uh, we'll be in touch soon and, and hopefully we'll see you at some of our other uh, upcoming presentations. Thanks for joining me in my garden. Have a good night. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, that was fantastic. Thank you. Everyone have a wonderful evening. Stay safe. Stay cool with this heat wave we're, we're about to go into and uh, talk to everyone soon. <laughs>